Hey guys, if you're shopping for knives and gear, make sure you check out the description of the video you're watching right now for a link to my Amazon store, where I've compiled some of the very best items available, including some of my own personal recommendations. Thanks! What's going on YouTube? Metal Complex here, and today I've got an interesting discussion video to share with you guys, one that I've been wanting to do for a long time, and that's what's so great about overbuilt folding knives. I wanted to find that for you guys real quick, so right around 2012, 13, and 14, uh, knives that had excessively thick blade stocks uh, and then were combined usually by excessively thick titanium scales were all the rage. And uh, this was blown up, at least in front of my face, by uh, channels like Jim Skelton's uh, channel. In fact, almost exclusively by Jim Skelton's channel because he had a taste for stuff like that. And I, I mean, I fell into that so hard. I thought it was so interesting. This wasn't right when I got into fully knives, but it was really, really when I dove into it. And at the time I thought, okay, so if it's thicker, right? If it's got more dense materials and it's big, this big thing, it must be more durable, right? Um, and that's not necessarily the case. And I'm gonna go ahead and point this out for, you know, the, inevitably there's um, people who are fans of the cold steel triad lock who wanna tell me that durability can only be defined by the triad lock. Um, or on the opposite end of that, people who are, you know, huge fans of the minimalist nature um, of the open L number eight and also the uh, the um, undeniable cutting performance of the open L number eight want to tell me that you know I'm, I'm sacrificing edge performance by having a blade I know in fact most of us know right that um, durability is not necessarily defined by thickness and that uh, obviously you're sacrificing cutting performance when you have an overly thick blade that's not I'm not going to try and justify <laughs> this stuff in this video and even the people reading those types of comments they know right um, so that's not really what we're going to be talking about um, but uh, there is certainly um, something enjoyable about a, an excessively overbuilt knife. And in, in some cases, some of these designs are actually, you know, real. I mean, not, not to say that any of these are not capable, because the truth is, is that it all depends on the design. Um, I, I suppose if we're going to talk about durability, we'll get into the meat and potatoes of the uh, discussion here. But if we're going to talk about durability and we're going to relate it solely to the triad lock, I love cold steel knives as much as the next guy, and I think the triad lock is awesome. But the truth is, is that the amount of human force that you could apply to the knife, you know, um, if there's something that's going to break, uh, there are a lot of other parts on any cold steel triad no lock knife that might, you know, uh, uh, sustain massive damage well before the triad lock does, which could render the knife useless anyway. And those same weaknesses apply to knives that don't have the triad lock, right? You can snap a tip on a cold steel knife just as easily as another knife with the same blade geometry well before either a frame lock or the triad lock fails. So, you know, there's a whole there's a whole level of complexity that goes into an argument like that. And I suppose I'm throwing that out there to avoid that type of discussion because we're really not going to focus on durability here. It's more so the appeal to knives like this, right? Uh, now, there's some true overbuilt kings out there. In fact, at some point, I'm going to do a top 10 or top 15 video talking about some of the most ridiculous monsters I've ever seen, including like the Praetorian Thai, uh, anything from Anthony Griffin. Oh my gosh, check out that guy's Instagram. That's insane. The Direware series knives, uh, you know, the uh, Trident knives, or I guess Crusader Forge, right? Some of those blades that have, you know, like a third of an inch, like Reese Whelan did a fatty slash one time where the blade was like a third of an inch or even a half of an inch thick. It was insane, <laughs> insane, right? It's not because those people actually think like that they're, there's, you know, they're creating something with a utilitarian benefit. Um, it's just like, wow, look at this. This is crazy, you know? And that's, that's kind of what I like. Now I have before you a few models that um, are overbuilt but still have utilitarian benefit. And I'm gonna talk about what I think is so interesting uh, about them and try and go into detail here. We have an actual Andrew Demko 8015. That is not a cold steel knife. That's the actual US made 8015. We have a Hinderer XM24, the big Hinderer. We have a uh, Medford Knives um, 187 DP. And then we have a Red Horse Knives Chopper. Uh, the main thing that these knives all have in common is uh, how ridiculously robust they are in both in terms of scale thickness and in blade thickness. I believe each of these knives is something like, well, all of them I think are 165 to 185 thousandths or 187 thousandths on the titanium. And then they all have 187 thousandths on the blade as well. 
is it necessary for the scales to be that thick? I don't think so. Um, but uh, I, I think the idea here with knives like this that are certainly still purpose built, I mean, people are going to argue, right? I can't avoid it. There's probably people already arguing in the comment section. There's nothing I can do about that. And no minds will ever be changed. The people who like them are going to keep liking them. The people who don't like them are going to keep not liking them, right? We just, it's, it's forever. Light versus dark. Um, the, uh, the idea here is to fill out the hand, uh, you know, with a knife, you know, that is made to be used. A knife that um, not only needs to be able to cut, but it doesn't necessarily be able to cut so efficiently that you can skin a grape. I use that example all the time. Um, a knife that's going to process thick, you know, dense material, rubber, thick wood, right, or might actually be used for some light chopping every now and then, despite that not being something that's suggested usually by the manufacturer. Um, generally, I think the thicker scales um, really help out. As, you know, in a design that uh, like the XM24 Spanto here that's meant to emphasize strength of the blade, uh, durability of the blade overall, right? The blade is, is thick so that it does that, but it also has to be tall enough so it drops down to an edge that can still actually cut. Maybe not super well, but, but can cut. So what you end up there with, you know, with, in this case is a long, thick, heavy blade. Balance is still very important, right? So to achieve balance and at the same time fill the hand out of somebody that's actually outside using this thing in gloves, right, which is probably how you're, you know, what you're going to be wearing if you're going to use this, um, to achieve both of those things, they make the scales a little bit more thick. Now, there's a lot of different ways to do this. You know, you can weight the backspace or, or whatever, but you know, a lot of times you just make the uh, titanium a little bit thicker. And uh, I think it's also a good idea that uh, the lock bar is a little bit thicker so that there's more surface contact on the tang of the blade during lockout. I think that's really, really important. Uh, but again, I'm not going to try too hard to justify um, the designs of a lot of these knives because the truth is, is I think a lot of them are born out of um, a fad that is, for whatever reason, kind of coming back. Like there's, there's every now and then I see a design out there where I'm like, they went hyper overbuilt with that. You know, is, is the whole hyper overbuilt thing coming back? Uh, the knife world is um, very uh, polarized right now. You know, we have, we certainly have a, a huge emphasis on designs that are not only aesthetically pleasing, uh, but also lightweight, perfectly balanced, and have incredible uh, edge geometry that emphasizes cutting performance. And then that, on top of the fact that we have this, we fetishize these exotic steels, right? The newest, craziest steel, right? Uh, you know, crew wear is not necessarily new, but it was interesting. And then the uh, uh, spy, whatever, what is the new Spider Coast steel? I can't remember what it is. And the new S45 VN. Oh, oh, 45. Well, the old one was 35, so 45, wow, right? It's probably pretty good, but you guys know what I mean, right? LC200N, Maximit, right? Um, the steels do boast some interesting um, specs, right? But it's it, a lot of it is just like, well, I want that because it's new and different, right? Because it's not D2, it's not S30V, it's not uh, M390, right? It's, it's new and it's different. So a lot of what draws us to knives is just whatever we consider to be appealing. And there's still a huge portion of the knife community that considers a general overbuilt nature to be appealing. And in the, the case of the 187, it's coupled here with 3V, which is a steel that's notoriously tough, right? So you have in Medford, uh, somebody who, Greg Medford's notorious for building knives that have an emphasis on like the aggressive look and how tough they look. And then you throw 3V steel on there and you PVD coat it right? You make it black and you've got these subdued, you know, anodizing marks here. And oh man, you know, amazing. You got hinder knives, right? Uh, again, you know, known for building some pretty overbuilt tank folding knives. And in the case of the XM24, it's just like beyond. Uh, the Andrew Demko 8015, Andrew Demko invented the triad lock. He also invented the scorpion lock, which I would argue, you know, is just as if not, you know, I don't know. Some people might argue it's more durable. I don't know, but it's, it's a lot of the same idea, except where you hold it, it's impossible for it to disengage because you're holding that scorpion lock in place. And then it has, you know, the thick scales, if you want to call that more durable or not, you know, whatever. It's got the robust blade stock that carries the thickness out to the tip. I mean, these knives, you know, these knives will stand up to natural human force, right? Now, if you put the knife in a vise and you drop an anvil, you know, from a, a crane, you know, 100 feet in the air, Will break it? Yeah, probably, but it'll also break, <laughs> it may not break a triad lock. In fact, none of these knives I think would fail in that case at the lock. Something else would warp out. You know, that's why 
it, not not I'm, I'm like asking for an argument on the triad lock here but <laughs> again guys i like the triad lock i do but it's like it's impossible not to talk about we're going to talk about overbuilt knives right uh the triad lock's amazing you know um but uh even still you know in a situation like that where you're doing something to the knife that is beyond any reasonable thing that you could ever expect a folding knife to do or a situation where the, the folding knife could you know reasonably get into uh yeah sure the triad lock probably won't fail in fact the most extensive insane you know testing in terms of durability will probably the end result will probably always be the same the triad lock will probably be the last lock to actually fail but the other elements of the knife that um, need to actually be in place in order for the knife to function, will those fail across the board at roughly the same time? Yeah. So if you've got one chunk of the knife left, that's the part that's attached to the triad lock and the triad lock's still functioning, well, great. <laughs> but the rest of the knife is not going to work, right? So that's why those arguments are just nonsense to me, right? Cold Steel's got great marketing. That's the way that that goes. But again, I, I hate to, I keep diving into that. I shouldn't be. The main thing, the main point here is that for some of us, just the fact that it is thick and heavy and it's like, I can't help, like I know that, that heft doesn't necessarily, heft and thickness are not synonymous with quality or durability. But the inner core of my brain, right? With the, I guess what some people call the lizard brain. Uh, it's just the initial like, in, you know, the instinct, the reaction, the, uh, you know, you, I can't help, that part of my brain is like, big knife, good, thick knife, good, feel good, right? I mean, that's just, that's how it is for some people, right? And I can't, uh, I can't tell you why I, I like feeling a knife that has all the, the clicks and the clunks and just the weight. A lot of it is not just the weight and mass of the object, but it's the feel of those, those um, elements, those parts of the knife all clicking into place together. There's also something to be said about a knife that absolutely feel, fills out the hand. You know, a hefty blade, uh, you know, I, I suppose the extra mass in the blade can help out if you are doing chopping tasks, but I also like a knife that feels incredibly secure in the hand and one that fills the hand, right? I mean, these are all knives that if I was really going to go, especially the Hinder or the Jimp Festival going on here, if I was really going to take them out and use them the way that they were intended to be used, you bet I'd be wearing gloves. You bet, because they're going to tear your hands up, right? So, you know, that object, you know, I, I thinking, you know, all the times that I've worked on construction sites uh, for my dad's construction company was when I was growing up. Uh, if you're, you're wielding a, you know, a big hammer, you know, a mini sledge, full sledge, you know, big pry bar, you know, whatever it is that you're using, it's generally a big, heavy steel object that's fairly thick. Um, part of uh, what I, you know, the, the sense of security as you're wielding this big, heavy thing where you're swinging it or you're pulling on it, you're prying with it, whatever you're doing, right? It's really important that you, you know, have a good grip on that object, that you can feel it, right? All those senses sort of sync up so that you can effectively, you know, transfer the energy you're trying to transfer into whatever job you're trying to do. And, uh, you know, you're not, you're not focused on whether or not you actually have a good hold on the object, right? Um, now, obviously, you know, people are going to be quick to point out, well, you're not going to be doing that type of stuff with a much lighter weight knife. So that may not be the, the best comparison. And you're right. But again, a lot of this stuff, you know, the, my joy for overbuilt knives, I don't know that I really have to justify. It's, it, it really just boils down to the fact that I just like them. I think they're interesting. They're neat. I don't know why it's so, um, you know, a, a thick overbuilt object is so interesting. I mean, that. The problem is, you know, with them is that for the vast majority of us, I always say this, the percentages of, you know, what people use knives for go roughly like this in my mind. 80% of us are simply leaving our house and going to a regular job where you might use a pocket knife um, once a day and you're going to be using it for stuff like cutting a thread off of your shirt, opening a letter, opening a box. And that's pretty much it, right? So we still want these big, heavy knives and we find different reasons to justify them. Or, you know, maybe it's, it's a bigger blade, a longer blade is more intimidating if you get attacked by ninjas or pirates or whatever, you know, at, the, at your grocery store. Okay. Um, you know, or, or maybe, you know, you, you feel like, you know, well, I, I don't feel like I'm going to have to use it for, you know, anything crazy, but I just like to feel prepared. Whatever your reason is, it doesn't matter, you know. I mean, here's, here's the end of it. We can enjoy whatever we want to enjoy. We can buy whatever we want and we can do whatever we want with it. 
despite what that guy says down there in the comment section. It's like, if you're going to spend that much money on it, you know, on an object that's made to be used this way, you should use it that way. Well, whatever. <laughs> that, that guy has no, there's no bearing on what you use your knife for. It doesn't matter. You can enjoy what you want to enjoy. Now, there are certainly overbuilt designs out there that are 100% meant to be appealing and basically nothing more than that. And you could argue that about any one of the knives that I've got out here. You could say, well, they're all overbuilt. It's just, it's all a parlor trick. It's all pomp and frill. It has nothing to do with function. And you can't, you know, those arguments will continue to exist forever. This, you know, I'm, I'm sure that people will, you know, but uh, you know, when it comes down to it, whatever it is that you do with a folding knife and whatever it is that you feel is appropriate or what you enjoy using, that's really all that matters. You know, if you like, if you like it, then, then go for it. But I just really, really like feeling that heavy thwack, you know, and often, I mean, I, I'll admit I've got, um, I enjoy overbuilt knives so much that I would love to own something that is so so overbuilt that it makes absolutely no sense. I'll bring up Anthony Griffin again, who's notorious for making knives that have half inch thick stock blades and quarter inch on the titanium, or sometimes bigger, sometimes bigger than that. Um, I think Nick Shabazz reviewed a, a knife that was like basically a sword. No, it was basically a folding battle axe, <laughs> just because it was fun. It was interesting, right? I mean, it's. It's funny and it's interesting, and I, I think they're you know the people who actually assume that you're gaining some sort of benefit from carrying something like that, you know, and are really serious about you know the the dimensions meaning something. I think there's there's very few of them, but most of us know you know it's, yeah, it's just fun. It's it's a, it's funny that it's so big and heavy, right? A lot of times it is a conversation piece, right? And you know there's there's a lot in the gray area. There's a lot. I, I would call a lot of these knives in the gray area because. There's nothing I, I do in my day-to-day -day knife where I day-to-day uh, -day knife my day-to-day -day life where I need an XM24 where I need a Medford 187 DP a Red Horse Chop or an, an AD15 nothing I do could justify those knives um, you know all the other knives that I, you guys have, have been watching my channel for a long time you know what I carry or what I use right everything that I you know, all the other knives that I use will do most of the, in fact most of the other like my PM2 is probably overkill right. In fact, I know it is. Um, I would get by in my day-to-day -day life, except for the weekends where we do the home projects, but my day-to-day -day life, I'd get by with a Victorinox Cadet. No problem. But that's not fun. <laughs> I want Sometimes I just want to carry a massive knife. You know, sometimes I want to carry my Hellhound Combat Truidon, right? I don't need to. I just want to. Um, there is definitely an appeal to these and finding, um, you know, for yourself, finding the, the mix between, you know, what you enjoy. If, if you enjoy lightweight, you know, super thin knives, that's great. You know, if they work out for you and you get a bunch of enjoyment out of them, then yeah, for sure. But if you enjoy overbuilt, massively thick knives and you can justify carrying them and you get enjoyment out of using them and you're getting your tasks done, right? If you're, if you are seeking to do a specific task, it doesn't matter what it is, but if you're enjoying carrying that knife, and there's a task that needs to be done and you can do it with the object and it brings you joy, then there is, you don't have to answer to anybody. You can continue to enjoy it. I, you know, to answer the question, what's so great about overbuilt folding knives? It's hard to say. I, it's just the general appeal of them being these massively thick objects that sort of defy the general idea of an EDC cutting tool. I mean, at base, an EDC cutting tool should be a, an, a, a bladed object that is uh, uh, you know an efficient cutter. Uh, it's easy to pull in and out of the pocket. Uh, it's easy to deploy, right? It's it's convenience. It's a tool of convenience, right? But you know these these correlations and the you know the necessity and which which elements of the blade are more or less important or make more or less sense for a, an an infinite amount of inconceivable circumstances. Emphasis on that. Again, nobody knows absolutely everything. <laughs> There's no, that no, any one person who can name every conceivable circumstance that you could ever use a folding knife for every conceivable, uh, task, right? You're, you're God, basically. What I'm saying is, is that person doesn't exist. So like what you like, you know, I love overbuilt folding knives, but I also love much smaller knives that make much more sense for EDC, uh, you know, everyday carry. It's just, that's, that's just how it is, you know? So Fads will be fads. Uh, the knife world will evolve in whatever way. To, you know, whatever there's demand for, that's what we're going to see. So, but the nice thing is, is 
the knife world is expanding in such a way that uh, it's catering to such a wide variety of different um, people that it, it seems like there will always be something out there for everybody. Every different type of knife guy or gal out there, there's definitely not just going to be one or two options. There's going to be a bajillion options just for you, right? And we can all argue for all eternity about what's best for what. <laughs> I don't know if anybody really got anything out of this. I mean, it was just a fun excuse to get out a bunch of uh, really big, massively overbuilt folding knives and talk about them, right? I probably should have picked them up and flipped them a little bit more. But in any case, I hope you guys got at least general entertainment out of this. As usual, I don't take myself too seriously. That's really what it's all about. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do, of course, have lots of videos of knives that are either expensive or inexpensive that I do or don't like. So check those out. And if you enjoy all my content, Go ahead and click on this metal complex logo right here and subscribe because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching, everybody, and have a great day.